Right, so let's take a look at the third of our causation videos, and that's surrounding intervening acts. We've already looked at the first two, the but for test, the factual test, and legal causation, causation in law. What we're now going to look at is we're now going to look at the third element that can break the chain of causation, which is the intervening act. And um, I'll start by just moving directly to look at our three different types. And our starting premise is that sometimes the sole cause of death or injury, and we'll talk about death or injury in this case, the sole cause of death or injury can seem to be a completely independent act. That is, it can be something that is outside of the control of the defendant. If we remember that our equation looked at the defendant's act, and we looked at the outcome, and we said that if any stage along that line something happened, to break the chain of causation, and I use this silly link diagram to say that, then the defendant wouldn't be liable. Now we've looked already at whether factual causation or legal causation, if the defendant was not factually the cause or the legal cause, then that would break the chain of causation. We can also break the chain of causation by an independent intervening act. And this is known by the Latin novus actus interveniens. And intervening acts fall into three categories. The acts of the victim, that is things that the victim can do that is outside of the control of the defendant that can intervene and break the chain. Or the acts of a third party, that is somebody other than the defendant or the victim who can do something that intervenes and breaks the chain. Or a naturally occurring event. And I'm just going to circle naturally occurring event because we don't deal with that. Um, well, I'm not going to deal with that on this video, partly because it doesn't form part of our syllabus. So the idea is, is that there are occasions on which either the acts of the victim or the acts of somebody other than the defendant or the victim, a third party, can intervene with a completely independent act and thereby breaking the chain of causation, meaning that the defendant did not cause the outcome, something else did. So we'll start by looking at the acts of the victim. And our starting premise for the acts of the victim looks at the general rule. And the general rule is that the defendant is liable, the general rule of causation that is, that the defendant is liable for foreseeable consequences of his actions. Now what does that mean? That means that the defendant is responsible, liable, for things that are obvious as a result of his actions. Where things are not foreseeable, where something happens, where the victim does something in which what they do is not foreseeable, it's not obvious, then that may break the chain of causation. And I'm going to use two very important and key cases to examine that. Uh, both involve what are known as escape cases. So they are both escape cases. There is another one. In fact, there are two more really that we look at, but I'm just going to focus on Roberts and Williams for now. In R.V. Roberts, the defendant um, interfered with the victim's clothes. The victim was a woman who uh, was inside a car with the defendant, and the, the defendant interfered with her clothes. She felt she was going to be sexually assaulted and jumped out of a moving car, sustaining quite serious injuries. The defendant claimed that it was her jumping out of the car that caused her injuries, not him. He claimed that her jumping out of the car was an independent and intervening act. The court said that the chain of causation will be broken only if the victim's actions were so daft as to be unforeseeable. So they used the word daft. And by that it means if the defendant did, sorry, if the victim did something that was so stupid that nobody could have foreseen that, then that will break the chain of causation. And this is known as the daftness test. And Roberts, the legal principle of Roberts is effectively the daftness test. Did the victim do something that was so daft that the defendant could not have foreseen it? In this instance, the court said no, it wasn't. It was quite reasonable that if you try to sexually molest or if you touch a woman in a car, it is quite obvious that she is going to think that she is in danger and it is quite obvious that she is likely to try to escape. Therefore, in R.V. Roberts, 
Roberts is still liable because the woman has not acted unforeseeably. She's not acted in a daft way. Contrast this, of course, with Williams, similar sort of case, but in there the victim jumped out of a moving car because he alleged that there had been an attempt to steal his wallet. So this is about wallet and theft, and this is about sexual assault. Now, from this, you can see immediately that Williams, or the, the, the victim in Williams, jumping from a car because he thought somebody was going to steal his wallet is daft. Nobody could ever foresee that if you try, even if it was true and you tried to steal somebody's wallet, that, it, uh, that the next thing that they will do is to jump out of the car. And because of this, it was held that it was an unreasonable reaction under the circumstances and disproportionate to the threat. It was held, therefore, that the chain of causation had been broken by the victim's intervening act. The defendant was not liable for the victim's injuries. So, remember, just contrast Roberts and Williams and apply the daftness test. Now, I'm going to introduce you to something that causes a problem, or a slight problem anyway, for the Victims Act and this idea of um, foreseeable consequences. Roberts makes it clear that only extreme acts will break the chain of causation and um, relieve the defendant of liability. Only where it is so stupidly daft will we um, be able to break the chain. But we've got to consider this in conjunction with the thin skull rule. And the thin skull rule says that the defendant must take his victim as he finds him. Take his victim as he finds finds him. Now what does that mean? What that means effectively is that even if injury or death is not reasonably foreseeable, the law still considers the defendant liable if the victim suffered from some physical or mental condition that made him or her more vulnerable. So if they are already carrying an injury or an illness that makes them vulnerable, even though that can't be foreseen, the defendant remains liable. And the key case for this is R. V. Blau. And R. V. Blau is a, is, a, is a case in which the defendant stabs an 18-year-old woman, puncturing her lung. At the hospital, the victim is told that she needs a blood transfusion in order to, for her life to be saved. But she refuses the blood transfusion on the fact that her religious beliefs, she's a Jehovah's Witness, which is why I sort of put that on the t-shirt there, that it was against her religious beliefs. She refused the blood transfusion and died the next day. And the legal principle that falls from that is that it's long been the policy of law that those who use violence on other people must take their victims as they find them. The principle clearly applies to the mental as well as the physical characteristics of the victims, and the court will rarely make a judgment as to whether the victim's response was reasonable. So, if your victim has something wrong with him or her, then you have to accept that as being foreseeable, even though it may not have been foreseeable. All right, so the thin skull rule um, generally will never break the chain of causation. So let's move on then to look at acts of third parties. And in acts of third parties, sorry, I'm, I'm just going to go back there. Well, you might have heard that. We said that's take the victim as you find them. It's also called the um, egg shell skull rule. All right, so you've got thin skull or egg shell skull, just so as you make sure. Um, and, and the reason that it's called that is that if you knock a person to the ground who is such a skull, and their skull breaks, even though you don't know that that skull is that thin, you should be liable, the defendant should be liable. It's not the victim's fault that they were not blessed with a more substantial skull. So that's why the thin skull rule is called as it is. So let's just have a look then at the acts of third parties. And this mainly takes the form of medical. All right, generally, most of the injuries or most of the incidents we're talking about, we are talking about acts of violence. And in acts of violence, somebody gets hurt. And if somebody gets hurt, they generally end up in a hospital being seen by doctors. So a doctor frequently becomes the third party that we talk about. And we've already seen two key cases here. We looked at Jordan and we looked at Cheshire. And if we remember, Cheshire was the tracheotomy scar in which the scar killed um, 
or the the the, the tracheotomy failing to heal and the scar tissue caused breathing problems which ended in death and in jordan we saw um, this idea that the defendant was getting better from a, a wound and then reacted badly to teramycin and died um, probably as an allergic reaction to teramycin. And we said that in Cheshire, this was still an operating and substantial cause, but in Jordan it wasn't because it formed part of the history, if you remember. The injury was better. The wound, the original operating cause was no longer operating. And what we also discussed in Jordan was this notion that the treatment was palpably wrong. And the idea that for an act of a third party to intervene, to break the chain of causation, it must be palpably wrong. All right, so think also here of this of the case that we've looked at of Smith. Even though the, um, uh, the doctor failing to attend was wrong, it wasn't palpably wrong in terms of being so bad that it became the main cause. So I'm just going to reiterate that just so as you're quite happy. In Cheshire and in Smith, although the behaviour of the doctors is wrong, it's not so palpably wrong that it actually creates a new cause in itself. In Jordan, the behaviour of the doctors is so palpably wrong. They gave a man medicine that he was allergic to, and it was that allergy that probably caused his death. The treatment is so palpably wrong that the original defendant ceases to become the operating cause, and therefore the doctors intervene in terms of causing death. The final case I want to look at are the co-joined cases of Malcherek and Steele. And um, they're joint appeals. They appeal together. Different cases, but come together to appeal together. And um, in in that, similar facts, but the defendant stabs his wife, who's taken uh, to hospital and put on a life support machine. She suffers two heart failures after 10 days, had irretrievable brain damage, and the doctors switched off the machine. And the defendant argued that switching off the machine broke the chain of causation. He did not cause her death, it was the switching off of the machine that caused her death. And the doctors, the court said that the doctor's decision did not break the chain of causation. The defendant's act could be regarded as the victim's, as a cause of the victim's death. So that's what we've got in terms of intervening acts. Let's go back up to here actually. There are three possible ways in which um, uh, uh, um, uh, the chain can be broken through a novus actus intervenience. The first is the acts of the victim, and we looked at predominantly escape cases, and we looked and contrasted Roberts and Williams. We also thought about this notion of foreseeable consequence and, and how the thin skull rule actually goes against foreseeable consequences. The second element is the acts of third parties. In that, we predominantly looked at medical cases and we contrasted Jordan and Cheshire and Malcherek and Steele and Smith to decide that the key word here was it has to be palpably wrong. The treatment by the doctor has to be palpably wrong to break the chain of causation. And the third are naturally occurring events, which we're not going to discuss any further. So I hope that's helped because that's the last video now on causation. We looked at the but for test, factual causation. We looked at legal causation and then we looked at intervening acts. If any one of those break the chain of causation, then the defendant is not liable. If none of them break the chain, then the defendant remains liable, at least in terms of issues of causation.